We have two microphones, so please just raise your hand if you want to ask a question or want to dig deeper into something. One, two. Thank you. Hi, Niklas Eimer, a question to Georgia. I see the point uh, of choosing a point of view, mm -hmm. but which, which kind of point of view did you, do you not choose? <laughs> sure, this is a good question. Of course, uh, as I was really trying to introduce, there's many, many, many ways a story can be told. Um, I mean, there's many points of view on that. We try to, I mean, just to be honest, we have really, really a small amount of time because we do the data analysis and the data visualization in just four days, and we really try to do our best to find how the most interesting thing that appears um, from the data, being something that we didn't expect, it, being something that uh, can open to further exploration, so that just is a, a starting point for readers to understand the topic, and we really have every time try to uh, correlate different kind of information, which I know your point is not the only point of view, but it's part of the job. We know that we are missing thousands of point of view, but this is a story that we tell in a Sunday cultural supplement of a newspaper. So it's really, really a story that we, we choose our uh, point of view to tell the story through. So I, I totally get your point. We miss lots of point of view every time. And you know, every time that we find a, an interesting data set and that we feed the data in print, we always say, oh, and this is so amazing. We have to do it interactive so that people can explore all of the layers. But most of the time, we're not able to do that. But yeah, I see your point. Yes, please. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, that was my question. If you have made any interactive uh, visualizations, and yeah, and what do you think of that? Yeah. So we did. I mean, uh, today, as I, I talk, and then you can also sure. talk before. <laughs> uh, um, as actually, we do a lot of different kind of information design work. So we build also interactive uh, visualization interfaces, and after, and that's it. Today, uh, I show. I mm, choose to show this kind of work, which is the pure data visualization work with the data and the most exploratory work. When it comes to interactive, you, of course, has the possibility to let um, readers and so users find their stories through data. So it's more that you build a tool, a sort of infrastructure, when you present the data and you give the possibility to let the, the readers and the user interact in their own way, finding their own path and really digging into the thing that they are um, w willing to explore. Of course, when you are in static data visualization, you have to pick a point of view. You have to let something uh, over, of course. So I think that, of course, interactive data visualization, also in the visualization that can really um, um, let users to explore and to find their path, is more exploratory tools. I would call lots of interactive data visualization as tool to explore rather than pieces to read. So this is my difference. I don't know. So, and for us, everything at the, uh, at the New York Times R&D lab that we try to build, um, we always try and build something that you can play with, something that we can touch and we can test out in the real world and see um, how effective a visualization it is or how effective a prototype it is. So it's, it's really important to us to make things that um, are instantiated in, in one way or another. So for the, the globe visualization that I showed, um, the, the live version of that means you can spin it around and zoom in and out and really try and um, get in amongst the data. Yes. You see him? Cool. So I have a question for you, Mike. Um, the maps over Afghanistan that you did were they used uh, afterwards for the, like, to raise the security in Afghanistan for the military or anything? Um, yeah, so um, immediately after we made the maps, we, um, one of my colleagues got a call from a think tank in Washington, and they used them uh, for the kind of arguments they were making for how they should proceed in Afghanistan. Um, we ended up doing a bunch of academic work around it, so there's a paper and there's a book coming out um, all about how to model the uh, conflict dynamics. So uh, yeah, it's gone in a number of different directions. Can I have a follow-up question on that, uh, Mike? What, what's the biggest aha moment you've experienced, you or your readers, when visualizing big data? Um, 
in general. So for the um, for the Afghanistan uh, map, it was um, it was definitely the relationship between the conflict uh, and the road that the the NATO forces were building around the 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 edge of the country. So you can really see. You don't even need to plot the road. You can see where it is from the ring of um, activity, and you can see the the um, the most activity taking place where the edges of the road are being built. Um, so, and with every kind of visualization, we always get some kind of correlation that suggests more questions. So all of the things we do uh, are always to kind of, to get in there, to, to start asking more subtle questions. Mike, for you, um, the data about um the usage of the New York Times page. Mm -hmm. Where did it actually go? Did it go into a boardroom um, where management would be thinking about solving the New York Times dropping leader, uh, readership, or what were the what, were, what was the audience? Um, so the audience for that is definitely to go into the rest of the building and to try and persuade. Um, the the organization to, to maybe think a little differently. That particular piece of work started getting implemented um, a month or so ago. So um, a, good, a good success from a, a project from the lab is when it gets to go and cause ripples in the in the organization. Um, and and that, this one was a, a particularly good one for that. Um, so yeah, hopefully it'll be implemented and we'll start seeing what how people use the site a bit more and less about what they're reading. Uh, hi, my name is Julia, and my question is for both of you. And I'm wondering how do you build your interactive uh, designs and what programming and stuff like that? Well, um, it depends. Uh, we, at Acura, we don't have a fixed uh, technology that we use. It depends from the aim. I think that our developers right now mainly work on D3 and customize their programming. But I have to admit, I have no idea because I'm not a coder. So. Uh, as I was saying before, for us it's very, very important to have built a team because I'm in charge of the representation of the information and every time I can talk with coders that can really do their job and also advise me which could be best ways to maybe uh, dig into the data, visually speaking. So, but right now I think that mainly we use D3. Yeah, so we've, um, over the last few years, we've been exploring lots of different technologies. So uh, I think in the, the talk you saw some Python and some um, ggplot in R, and then the more recent stuff is all JavaScript. So um, the two the two visualizations that Nick made are both in Canvas, um, and he's but he's not a good example. He's a bit of a, um, a crazy whiz kid and uses the graphics, um, the GPU to to do a lot of that work. Um, other stuff that we've done, we use a lot of D3 and JavaScript based things. It's really good for being able to build a really complicated visualization and get it in front of a lot of people quickly, um, a lot better than um, the just building little, the kind of more scientific plots, which you have to embed into a PDF and then persuade people to open. Um, just clicking through onto a, a JavaScript-based interactive is, is so much easier. One more thing. Is there a question? Uh, there's, there's a guy behind, behind the uh, screen okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> Way back. Hi, uh, my name is Ola. Uh, this one's for Mike. Uh, this team that works with data visualization based on big data, has it ever kind of looked to something like um, grounded theory, which is a social science uh, methodology for abductive theory generation? Um, not that I know, I'm afraid. What's the name of the theory? Grounded theory. It's grounded. grounded in data, trying to find invariances and builds theory from the patterns that are identified rather than the hypotheses that is formed ahead of time. Right. So, um, without much discipline, that's definitely the way that we work. Um, but I would love to know more about the the uh, the discipline and the the written down theory would be fantastic. Um, we've all got really disparate backgrounds in the lab, so. Um, theories like that don't show up in an engineering course, unfortunately, so uh, I'd love to know more. Um, interdiscipline is a, is a hard thing to accomplish. Yes. <laughs> a 
Okay. I do have a final question. Uh, when you do this, it feels like it's, it's lots of manual work. You go through the data, you, you decide what to scrap and what to not, and, and your work is almost like artwork. I mean, it's lots of hours goes into it. Are there any pieces you could automate to make them quicker or more, more direct, or is it, is it always this handiwork that needs to be done, uh, collecting and, and, and selecting? And, and so for us, we, we work a lot. Every project gives rise to new tools. And then we try and keep those tools in into the next project. And so um, we've, we've, we're building up a really interesting tool set that's all on GitHub, um, if anyone's interested. Um, it allows us to do these, these slightly more impressive engineering feats. So to get all of the click, all of the page views on the New York Times into one browser window has built up on lots of, uh, of other tools that we've built up over the last, um, I guess, the last few years. Okay. Yeah, in, in our case, for this project, everything is very manual and very customized to the uh, piece that we want to build. So we basically work with Excel and Illustrator. And wow. sometimes <laughs> you can, of course, automate the way that the most part of information are represented, but uh -huh. everything then is really refined in Illustrator, trying really to be very precise. So it's really passing from Excel to Illustrator. Okay. So I would like to say thank you for making us understand complex things better. Thank you very much for great presentations and uh, Thank yeah. You.